Welcome. Bastille Day means the annual military parade in Paris, a chance to remind the planet that France has soldiers deployed in Mali, the Central African Republic, in the fight against ISIS, and on home soil, beefing up anti-terror patrols. It's a stretch, but France has friends and allies. Well, on that score, there is trouble on the northern flank. France's defense partnership with the UK is closer than ever, but after Brexit and a Chilcot report that highlights how the 2003 invasion of Iraq has made the UK gun shy, could it be the beginning of the end of the Entente Cordiale, as it was called 100 years ago in World War I? Both France and Germany making overtures towards reviving what had seemed like a stillborn idea. That of a continental army. We're going to listen to uh, François Hollande and ask our panel about the future of security in Europe and around the world. Today in the France Venquet debate, the British are going. And with us to talk about it, former French UN general Dominique Trinquant. Always a pleasure. Thank you for being with us. Uh, happy Bastille Day to Professor Frédéric Charion, former head of the French Defense Ministry's Strategic uh, Research Institute. Thank you for being with us. And from London, we're joined by Nick Whitney, Senior Policy Fellow at the European Council on uh, Foreign Relations. Glad you could join us. Uh, good evening and uh, happy 14 juillet. <laughs> Merci. Uh, happy 14 juillet to Thomas Worthington, uh, who is the editor of uh, the Armada Review. Tell us what Armada Review is. Uh, first of all, it's Withington and it's Armada International. But um, just to echo um, my British colleagues, happy Bastille Day uh, to all of our, our French colleagues and uh, uh, viewers this evening. Armada International is a, a leading defence magazine. All right. Thank you for being with us. The France Venquet debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter at the hashtag F24Debate. Now, before we talk Brexit, there's no getting around the Bastille Day parade. To mark the centenary of World War I's Battle of the Somme, Australia's Governor General, New Zealand's Prime Minister, in attendance as two of their units marched alongside the French down the Champs Elysees. For some, the remembrance was personal. Uh, my great grandfather served on the front, Western Front in 1917. Um, only for a short period, he was subjected to a gas attack and had to be repatriated to Australia. I'm very proud to be here today. This is a great opportunity. I'm very proud to be here and representing Australia. It's remarkable when you think about it. Uh, these people literally went halfway around the globe to fight in World War I. Yes, of course. And it's very interesting also when you visit this country to see that it's a uh, it's an important event in the story of the of this country. For the first time in the Commonwealth, this army, Australia, New Zealand, were fighting as Australian and New Zealand. And that's why it's very important for them. And they are coming in France one century after the Battle of the Somme, where the, for the first time they were really seen as Australian and uh, New Zealanders. Well, talk us through what the, that because France is the only Western nation that has this kind of military parade. Talk us through what it means when you're a soldier and, and it's the Bastille Day Parade. Well, it's very important. Uh, I was asked uh, if I ever uh, uh, got through, through this parade. Of course, when I was a, a young cadet in 40 years ago now. I was on the Champs Elysees 40 years ago, yes. Uh, and that was a, that's always a great event because it's a communion between the people, the French people and the army. Uh, and that's very important when you see where the, currently the French services are deployed. They are fighting war abroad but also they are protect, protecting the citizen in France. And you see the last, uh, um, I mean, the 87% uh, eight, of, I think, of the French people are, have a positive uh, view on the, on the French army. So it's a, uh, the 14 juillet is really a physical communion where it's not only talking, the people are there. I was on the Champs-Élysées today, and it's amazing to see the people. I was uh, with, uh, with ladies who are making the uniforms, you know, who were on the parade, and they were crying. They were just crying and say, this is uh, our army. We are working for them. It's very important for us. Frédéric Charion, a few years back, uh, the, when the French army marched, we were thinking about the uh, interventions in places like Mali, the Central African Republic. Was Brexit on your mind when you saw the, the parade today? Well, not really, because first of all, the, the parade is 
not about uh, the EU, uh, although there is a, a strong link, of course, between the European armies, European defense, and, and France. But I think Brexit is something different. And there, there are some consequences on different levels. But probably, you know, the parade of, the, of a day like, like this one is not about Brexit. And, but there are consequences. We'll probably talk about it. Uh, Nick Whitney, uh, the Bastille Day Parade, I is it uh, something that uh, you wish the British had, or is it an anachronism? It's, um, it's never been a British tradition. I, I think we all have difficulties, or have had difficulties, since the end of the Cold War in keeping the armed forces in the public's eye and um, encouraging members of the public and taxpayers to understand what it is that they are supporting. Um, but um, different countries, different traditions. And th did you have Brexit on your mind when you, when you saw the, the, the French military? And you know uh, how much ties between Britain and France have grown closer over the past mm. couple of years. I have Brexit on my mind uh, every day at the moment. I personally regard the decision as a, as a massive strategic mistake. Um, but we've made our bed. We must lie on it. And I certainly do hope that we can work our way towards an arrangement where we maintain or perhaps even intensify defence and security ties, because defence and security cooperation in Europe has never been um, something that Brussels has controlled. It's always been a matter of voluntary cooperation by sovereign governments. So it oughtn't to offend the the principle of Brexit from the British point of view to carry on copper cooperating with Europe and in fact to do more of it. Um, but this is a divorce and rational considerations don't always come to the fore in a divorce. So although I think it would benefit Britain and benefit the EU27 to, to carry on to intensify defence and security ties, um, we'll have to see whether we actually manage to achieve that. Thomas Withington, uh, do you agree that uh uh, uh, it's become emotional and a little irrational, some of the reactions when it comes to Brexit? I would absolutely uh, agree with what my British colleague said just there. Uh, it's hard really to sort of think about anything else at the moment. Um, I think there perhaps has been some emotional reaction, quite a bit of emotional reaction, but I think that is perfectly understandable given what's happened. Uh, again, um, I also share the opinion that I think it's been a colossal strategic own goal, what we've done. And if you want to use a military analogy for this, it is akin to getting a rifle and shooting ourselves in the foot, in the foot uh, as the United Kingdom. So it, it, is, it is on, I think, many people's minds. But I think also the parade today, uh, which I'm a, a big fan of and I, I always endeavour to try and watch, is a reminder of the important contribution that, that French defence and the French military make to European security, not just at home, but around the world. Not just at home, but, but around the world. Uh, some, some of the reactions to Brexit, among the first to congratulate Britain, uh, uh, Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, who this Thursday, mm -hmm. by the way, welcomed a U.S. Secretary of State who'd flown in from the Bastille Day Parade in Paris. And then, of course, there's been all the talk uh, um, General Trinquant about Britain's new foreign minister, Boris Johnson, uh, who's compared Vladimir Putin to Dobie the house elf in Harry Potter, uh, but who was also taking digs at Brussels over the Ukraine crisis. Back in May on the campaign trail, he said, if you want an example of EU policy making on the hoof and the EU's pretensions to running a defense policy that have caused real trouble, then look at what has happened in Ukraine. Do you agree with Boris Johnson? Uh, on Ukraine, I'm not exactly on the same side. I, I, I must confess that on Ukraine, the, n not the EU, but the link between uh, Mrs. Merkel and uh, President uh, Hollande make uh, a big difference in the arrangement in Ukraine. Uh, we, we had on one side, uh, say, the, the NATO uh, bulldozer uh, facing the Russian in Ukraine, and on one and on the other side, we've got this EU uh, small music played by uh, M Mrs. Merkel and uh, President Hollande, saying we've got to have an agreement. Russia is not invading Ukraine, 
There is a tension, there is a crisis. But they did invade Crimea. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we can discuss a long time about Crimea. The little green men and everything we saw. And, uh, it was an invasion. Mr. Putin, it's, Mr. Putin, it's unequivocal. But Mr. Mr. Putin can talk about Kosovo, about South Sudan, about different places in the world where you've ch changed the, the border. So, I mean, uh, just take that away. We can have long discussion about that. Right, let me ask Nick Whitney on this. Uh, the, uh, the defense minister stays the same in Britain, uh, Mr. Hammond, uh, but what, will the new foreign minister help or hurt defense policy? The um, defense minister is uh, Mr. Fallon. Um, I find it astonishing that Boris Johnson is our international representative. I, I noticed today that Monsieur Eho greeted him by remarking that he was a proven liar, which was not a good start to uh, uh, Anglo-French bilateral relations for the future. I assume that Mrs May has decided that um, she needs him in the cabinet and the foreign office is where uh, he can do least damage because most of Britain's foreign relations in the next few years will be concentrated almost exclusively in the business of negotiating Brexit, for which we are creating a new government department headed up by David Davis, and um, in the question of pursuing this idea that we can do lots of quick trade deals around the world, which is a responsibility which has been given to a third minister. So I'm not quite sure what will be in Boris Johnson's intray. Um, I suspect there's a lot of traveling in prospect for him. He said that uh, relations with Europe could intensify. Do you agree with that, when it, especially looking at it from a defense perspective? Well, um, they certainly could, they should, and I wasn't aware that he'd said that, but I'm very glad to hear it. The situation is that although Britain had enormous potential to contribute to European defense, in recent years we have been more obstructive than constructive. Um, we've delayed various initiatives like the headquarters that, they, that is needed in Brussels, like increasing the size of the European Defence Agency budget. If we took this as a cue to abandon those obstructive stances and actually cooperate more with, um, with France, with Germany, with, with others in Europe, this could be a positive gain for both parties. For example, France has been very active in the Sahel and um, in trying to use uh, military force to improve stability in that very troubled southern periphery of the continent. The British have not joined European actions in those places. But if we were to do so now, um, I think this would be good for us collectively in Europe and, and preserve ties between Britain and, and the rest of Europe, which we shall need to do even after Brexit. Well, Thomas Withington, on that point, uh, the, uh, uh, there seems to be a bit of a double whammy in Britain because there's the Brexit and there was the recent Chilcot report. And do you think that interventions like the ones Britain did in Kosovo, in Sierra Leone back in the 90s, that those would be possible today? Um, very interesting question. And um, I think the whole issue of Britain's strategic posture is a very serious issue for debate because what we've seen really over the last few years is a progressive reduction in the size of the British Armed Forces. To give you an idea of this, the British Army currently has about 87,000 regular troops. The French Army has 111,000. And it is said, for instance, that if we were to face uh, a similar crisis in the Falklands, Malvinas Islands, that we faced in the early 1980s, we simply wouldn't be able to do the operation. And I think our ability to support operations like Kosovo, our ability to support operations in Iraq, I think uh, show our armed forces are stretched to the absolute limit. And given the pressures that everybody's expecting on the UK economy, with Brexit now becoming a reality and the possibility of a recession as soon as next year, perhaps, the spending power on materiel, on troops, on personnel to keep the armed forces capable of doing its job is going to simply diminish. And we've got, there is a double whammy going on because on one hand, we've got a, a, a reduced size of an arm, the armed forces are reducing in size. And secondly, I think what we're also seeing in this is that Britain hasn't really developed a role from the Second World War. We, we decided not to go down the European Union route, as we've shown with this vote. 
we are still clinging to the idea that we're some kind of major global global power who can punch above our weight. And politicians live in a, a beautiful world of absolute delusion that this is the case. And until these kind of issues are, are really concentrated and looked at and, and focused on, I see Britain's strategic footprint diminishing by the year. Well, Frédéric Chaillon, in fairness, uh, though that uh, claim that the French uh, box above uh, their weight category has also been made. And even when there was the intervention in Mali in the Central African Republic, people said, hey, we, don't have, we can't afford it. Yeah, that's a, a regular, uh, very usual debate about France trying to uh, punch about its weight in, in international relations. On the, other, on the other side, on the other hand, the, the paradox is that in most operations where France is involved, uh, and mostly uh, in most cases, it's because no one else wants to, to go. <laughs> and France knows the, uh, the, the, the ground, knows the, the situation, especially in Africa, especially in Mali, Central Africa too, but it was the case in different cases in, in, in Africa before. So there is a paradox here because uh, France at the same time is accused of trying to punch above its weight. And on the other hand, most uh, allies or partners agree to say that mm -hmm. only France can do it. So hence the problem. We, France cannot do everything, and especially cannot do everything alone. And that's pr probably where we really need uh, Britain and the UK with us. Not necessarily in the EU framework, but as a, as a partner, which won't be put too much into question, I think, because the Lancaster House uh, agreements we're won't gonna, be put into question. We're going to talk about the, the, those Lancaster House agreements when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate.